Thank you, Laura. Yeah, we appreciate that so much. Yeah, it seems like it's um, whoever is here is a true New Englander. <laughs> they can handle the snow, and, and I'm sure that uh, yesterday was it was difficult for everyone. And we pray, Lord, for those who are not here mm. that have not, uh, you know, they, they can't can't make it. Um, well, let's begin. With Father, for Abraham, who was our father in faith, was looking for the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Mm -hmm. So we have the citizenship in heaven, awaiting our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to be subject to all things to himself. We ask, Lord, that you would be with Steve Rodance as he leads us in prayer. So, I'm not Steve Rodance, Bruce, Bruce Anderson, that's not right. Bruce Anderson as he leads us in prayer. Our pastor as he leads us in worship, and that he would be helped by the Holy Spirit, that we may see Christ in his glorious return. Yes, this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's, let's stand now for the call to worship from Revelation 4, verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed. And we're created. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, in 216. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise him, for he is thy help and salvation. All he who hear, now to his temple draw near. Join me in glad and oration. Praise to the Lord, for all things so Let 
should praise the Lord. And all life you have made. You are the fountainhead of life. And you give breath to whom you will. And we should come with praises before you. We should hear what you have to say. And we should have a resounding amen to it. Yes, Lord, so be it. That should be the sound that comes, especially from your people. We should not resist your holy will, but we should follow you. And with joyful hearts, Lord. So we come to you today as we are. And we do have some measure of joy in us. But will you grant to us joy unspeakable and full of glory? We come to you today at a certain point in time, but you're the author not only of the present, but eternity past and eternity future. And so gladly forever, we will adore you, not because of what our hands have done. We could not save our guilty souls but because of what your son has worked for us. So we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand now and say together the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. today at something that's not in our normal rotation. Every once in a while, we'll have that opportunity. We do today. So I, I wanted to read to you from 1 Corinthians 15, which is the chapter that focuses on resurrection. And in the discussion of resurrection that Paul is bringing to the Corinthian church, that he, he actually begins with these words, verses 3 and 4 of that chapter. For I delivered to you as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he goes on from there that all of the rest of the chapter is really about the implications of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that should mean to us and why it's important to us in terms of understanding our destiny and our Christian hope. That it's very important for us to focus on the resurrection of Christ and to make that connection between his resurrection and our eternal condition. So 
So that's important. Now, I want you to just note here that he says that this is of first importance. So if we take something that God says is of first importance, and we make it to be of subsidiary importance, not that important, maybe other things are more important to us, wouldn't that be sin to where we would place our judgment ahead of God's and say, well, I'm interested in your opinion, oh my God, but I have some other things that are more important than what you're saying is of first important importance. Of course, that would that would be sin. But which one of us can say that we haven't done it in this matter where we've allowed what we often call the tyranny of the urgent? You know? We've we've really more accurately decided that we all make the determination as to what is urgent rather than God. He's saying here, look, there's something urgent and important for your consideration here today. And it has to do with these things that are listed here. See that Christ came and he lived, he died. He died for our sins. This is the center of, of not only everything that we have in the scripture, but also everything that we have in history and the future. Christ came, he lived, he died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures that he was buried. He was attested as someone who had died, who was even buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, that this was something that the Old Testament uh, um, uh, scriptures had prepared us for this coming resurrection and, uh, and then everything else that he goes on to say. So this is so important for us. And I think we can just see that. And I, I don't want to really belabor it more than what I've already said here right now. Let it just sink in that too often we've made our own determinations of what's of first importance and that that's sin. It's a good thing for us to confess that sin before Almighty God. So I've included here a confession of sin based on those verses. Let us confess our sins together. Lord God, we have heard the gospel and we hold fast to this good news of your victory over sin and misery. We thank you for the death and resurrection of our Savior. We have been given many evidences of the truth of these events recorded in your word. Surely our faith is not in vain, for Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits among many brethren. Those who have fallen asleep in him are not lost, but are safe and alive in him. We look forward to the return of your son when he will destroy death and bring the fullness of life to all of your people. Nonetheless, we honestly acknowledge that we have often lost sight of these matters of utmost importance. The passing demands of the fading world have seemed more pressing to us than you. Please forgive our confusion and our sin. Show us again the constancy of our Savior, who never forgot to keep first things first. In Jesus' name, amen. And isn't that really the key for us, is that Jesus didn't sin in this way? That he always had just the perfect priorities. And he, he was so continuously communicating with his Father and saying what his father would have him say, doing what his father would have him do. Hear this. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful.
Heavenly Father, we are so thankful this morning that in the face of our faithlessness, you are always faithful. We thank you to awake this morning to this winter wonderland, a landscape that uh, we often see in pictures, but the past several years have not seen in reality. But we thank you for the plenty of white snow that is all around us, even though it is difficult to manipulate and move within. But to wake to a crisp, clear, chilly New England morning is refreshing, Lord. And this is the day that you have made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you for the heat and the shelter that we have on a day such as this. But come the spring and the summer, as the melt continues, we know that you, even in this cold climate, are replenishing our water tables. So we will have refreshing cool water in the summer. We thank you for the snow which comes. And we thank you for the pleasure that we see in the faces of young children, as they may see this wonderment for the first time. We enjoy seeing them frolic and play in it, perhaps remembering days when we did too. We thank you for our memories. Thank you for our senses that allow us to see this beauty and to hear the whisper of the wind through the trees. We thank you, Father, for the plow drivers who have worked tirelessly, and diligently overnight to clear the road so that we would all be able to get here this morning to church. And for those who have not been able to get here, perhaps they are plowing themselves out. We just ask your blessing upon them as they do so. Your word, Lord, says, though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose blood our sins are taken away. We also want to lift praise to you, Lord, for the safe delivery of a baby boy to former EPC member Bethany Larson, Nichols, and her husband, Brandon. We thank you for this addition to your family. We also lift um, Amanda Giacana. We pray for the students that she is reaching out to at the University of Maryland through RUF. We pray for this ministry and pray that she would help them and help equip them to serve you. We pray that they would experience the love of Christ in a whole new way as they come to know your warm embrace. We pray for a dear friend of Mary Tauscher's, Linnea, who went in for knee replacement surgery on Monday. We pray for her quick recovery and rehabilitation of the knee, that she would regain that. But more importantly, Lord, we pray for her salvation because you are the healer of what really ails us. And we pray that she would experience your grace in every way and for her eternal well-being. We also pray for God's peace and love to Elaine, her daughter-in-law, and Bob, her son, and their family as they make some very difficult and necessary decisions as they go forward. So we just ask that you would keep them in your hand and guide their decisions. We lift up Matt and Rachel Parks and their children uh, as they have, the whole family has experienced bouts with COVID. Though there are reports that uh, they are improving, we just pray that you would restore their energy, give them good rest, and that they'd have no lingering after effects from this sickness. We also lift up Michael and Miles Farley, the husband and son of Lauren Farley, who passed away this past Monday after a very quick diagnosis and bout with cancer. Please pray that God of all comfort would comfort them with the comfort that only he can give. We lift up Lori Stefaniak, a, a member of the Women's Evening Study Group. Uh, she was previously dealt with stage four squamous cell carcinoma and recently uh, found a lesion and has had an appointment with doctors at 
in Boston, we pray, Lord, that you would help the doctors to have wisdom in determining a diagnosis and treatment plan, and also comfort Laurie as she goes through this scary process once again. We lift up our missionaries that we support, Corey and Amy Havlicek. We praise you, Lord, for the provision of their visas and the ability to return home to Oaxaca, Mexico. Pray that they will find a new home in Oaxaca. Pray that uh, they will remain energized and excited to return and pick up their uh, duties with Wakelet. And pray for new partners and opportunities to share their ministry and also to meet their budgetary increase. We also lift up Erin Vogan, who has recently found out that she is going to have to undergo continuing treatments that they weren't anticipating every three weeks. So we just ask for Andrew Vogan and his family and Aaron as she goes through this uh, trying time in the treatment of this ongoing cancer diagnosis and treatment, that you would be with them, that you would embrace them, that you would lift them up, and that they would know your love for them at all times. We also bring before you uh, Deb Nicely, who was diagnosed with a couple of infections and is on antibiotics. We just pray, Lord, that they would be effective and that she would soon return back to full health. Uh, we also want to lift up uh, the Johnson family, Bruce and Betsy. We thank you, Lord, that Betsy has recovered from the illness that she has had, uh, that she is sufficiently well to pick up extra duties around the house because Bruce, who was uh, also ill with whatever bug they caught, uh, has been diagnosed with uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia and is on uh, uh, dose of antibiotics this coming week for it. We just pray, Lord, that uh, you would give wisdom to the doctors, that you would hold them in, in your hands, and that it would remain in a benign state, and that it would not grow worse and become uh, more serious. We also want to lift up praise for Bruce's brother, Dale. We've all been praying for him, and his recent CAT scan showed that uh, He's doing well, even though the diagnosis is terminal, uh, he has a stay at this time. And statistically, doesn't have a great chance, but we like to think, as Bruce thinks, that statistics do not matter to our great God Almighty, that you can overcome our statistics at all times. And that reminds me of what we just heard this morning message from Steve that do not put our wishes and our statistics in front of your great plan for you are able to accomplish all that you have determined. We also want to lift up Good Shepherd uh, Agricultural Mission in uh, Bombasa, India uh, for Aunt Andy Violet as she recovers. Uh, Vishal has just shifted from the junior hostel to our senior hostel. An exciting time for any boy there at the mission they say. And also pray for uh, good weather as it comes uh, to harvest time for the mustard crop, that uh, they could really use the sun to dry it out. Uh, we lift up all these concerns, Father, and they are all in your hand. Lord, let us know that though we lift up our concerns and our prayers, what's on our hearts, you answer in your time and not ours. Help us to be able to accept what those answers are, even though they may be uncomfortable at times. But we know in your great good plan that for all who trust in your Lord, Son, Jesus Christ, you are working all things for our good. We thank you, Father, that you have brought us here this morning to hear your word. We thank you for the opportunity to worship together. We ask you to open our ears, open our minds, give us hearts to love, your word, for it is great. It is a feast. We ask that you would prepare Steve as he gives your word this morning. We thank you for his servant, servant's heart mm -hmm. and for his wonderful gift of preaching and teaching that you have given to us at these times. We just ask your blessing upon this word this morning. 
In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> So our Old Testament reading is again from the book of Exodus, chapter 23, this morning, as we're continuing in this case law. And tonight, when we come to this, we're going to think about this in terms of our <laughs> eternal uh, environment and think about how things uh, will change and be different than that. Regard. So here we have Exodus 23, given so long ago. You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with the wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice, nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. If you meet your enemy's ox or his donkey going astray, you shall bring it back to him. If you see the donkey of one who hates you lying down under its burden, you shall refrain from leaving him with it. You shall rescue it with him. You shall not pervert the justice due to your poor in his lawsuit. Keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and righteous, for I will not acquit the wicked. And you shall take no bribe, for a bribe blinds the clear-sighted and subverts the cause of those who are in the right. You shall not oppress a sojourner. You know the heart of a sojourner, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. For six years, you shall sow your land and gather it in its yield. But the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow, that the poor of your people may eat, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. Six days you shall do your work, but on the seventh day, you shall rest, that your ox and your donkey may have rest. And the son of your servant woman and the alien may be refreshed. Pay attention to all that I have said to you and make no mention of the names of other gods, nor let it be heard on your lips. Three times in the year, you shall keep a feast to me. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. As I commanded you, you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib. For in it, you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty handed. You shall keep the feast of harvest of the first fruits of your labor, of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labor. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened or let the fat of my feast remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression. For my name is in him. <laughs> but if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I blot them out. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do as they do, but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their pillars in pieces. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from among you. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my terror before you. And will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I will send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the wild beasts multiply against you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and possessed the land 
and I will set your border from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the Euphrates, for I will give the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them and their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. We certainly remember the history of Israel and see that that's precisely what happened. So Matthew 14, 22 through 33, now our gospel reading, this is after Jesus fed the 5,000, all right? Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he dismissed the, the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and and came to Jesus, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Amazing confession there. We think of, often of Matthew 16, where Peter makes that confession. There were times even prior to that where people were realizing of the disciples of who Jesus was, at least to some degree. I guess there was just a lot that they don't understand, but that's not that surprising. Is it? <laughs> Hebrews 6. And we're continuing in these epistles now. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God and of instruction about washings, the actual word there is baptisms, the laying on of hands, the res resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do, if God permits, for it, it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that, he, that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated, receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name and serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear. He swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise for people swear by something greater than themselves. 
and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. All right, please stand now. We're looking at 1 Corinthians 3, again, continuing, verses 10 through 15, our passage this morning. It's entitled, The Church is One Foundation. We're looking at, remember that, Greg Hem? Beautiful idea here. And sometimes we think about uh, Christ being the cornerstone. That's what it says, for instance, in Ephesians, and foundation of apostles and prophets. But here it uses the symmetry of Christ himself as the foundation. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is, busy, is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Please be seated. Now, I notice that as people look at this passage, there seems to be one major confusion. I'd even say that the majority of people that look at this passage, they generally, I think, go in the wrong direction. There's one matter of confusion here that we should really settle right away. And that is that this passage is within the context of talking about different leaders in the church that people are aligning themselves with. In other words, these are all builders of the temple. That's at least what they claim to be. And that's why Paul here would talk about himself as, as a skilled master builder. But how are we to evaluate the ministries of these various leaders, whether of Paul or Apollos or others who are serving there or even these so-called super apostles that are mentioned later in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and the Judaizers that are coming along telling people what they should be doing that's different than what Paul has said. So you got all these competing builders, and what Paul is saying here is they will all be judged, and we're told here something about that. And oftentimes where the confusion comes in, is that people think, well, this is about each and every individual saint first and about my judgment as a saint. Well, it is in a way, and we all in, in, in a way participate in the ministry of the word, right? By how we live even, we're a living letter. So we can get to our own part in this, each of us, but it's best if we first think about it in terms of those leaders that are particularly charged to preach and teach the message of the cross of Christ connected with that resurrection, this thing we call the gospel that's supposed to be proclaimed, all right? 
Think about that first. And how will those people be judged regarding that? And then think about our own part in it as well. Okay. So the church is a body, we're told. We have a lot of different imageries used throughout the scriptures. But we know that the body is connected to a head. And Christ is the head. We also sometimes think about the church as the bride of Christ. But then, again, Christ is the husband connected to this bride. Here, we're thinking about the church as a building. Even you think about the Old Testament tabernacle and then the temple that replaced the tabernacle as the central place of worship in the Old Testament. But eventually, that temple must give way to the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have Christ, the cornerstone of that temple. Then we have the apostles and prophets of the first century. We have their words recorded for us in scripture. They become foundational to this, but Christ himself is the foundation. So there's a connection between this word of Old and New Testament and Jesus as the word. So that the whole of the word of the scriptures is actually all about Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's so important for us here. And, and <laughs> this is given as a grace to, the, to those who would be preaching this word. So God has given a grace to them, a gift, in other words, to actually use for the building up of the body of Christ. But Christ himself is the foundation of his new temple, the church. And so Paul has served as a skilled master builder. What does this mean? Well, he was the one who planted the church through this preaching of the word of the cross, right? He, he was the first one that did that. And probably a lot of the people that were actually trained by him have, have now gone on to be leaders in different ways in the church. So Paul, what did he do? He said, I laid a foundation for you. And we wonder, well, what is this foundation? He's going to answer that very plainly here. What is it? Who is it? How are we to understand the foundation? But, but he, before he tells us exactly what that foundation is, he says that there are other people that come and build upon that foundation. Of course, if someone comes along and tries to lay out a completely different foundation, well, that that's not building on the foundation. But even if you claim, well, we're, I'm going to build on Paul's foundation that he laid, and then you end up building up something, well, the question is, is it, is it actually something that's going to last? Is it something that actually should be in the place where it is, or, 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 is, or is it out of, out of place and not really a part of, of this building? So who are these other people? Well, it's Paulus, it's others, it's the super apostles. But he says, look, a word of warning to anyone who would undertake that ministry. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. Apparently, that it's possible that a builder doing that, this work, like me here, here I am in Exodus. You know, I'm trying to actually be used by God to build up a church together with others in this community that are trying to do the same. You know, it could be that we, we, we do work that's good. It could be, though, couldn't it, that we do work that's not good, that's actually bad, and we could say there's something wrong about this. This is what we want to explore. How do we know when the work is good or bad, all right? He says, let each one take care how he builds, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's the answer to our question. You know, what, what is this foundation? Jesus Christ is the foundation of his church. Maybe there are other ways that a minister can do a bad job. I'm sure there are. But the one that he's focusing on here is when someone ignores the one foundation of the church in preference for other things that in that time and place might seem to be obviously more important than Jesus. And there are a lot of candidates for false foundations, but there's only one true foundation of the church for all times and places. 
All right. So now the next thing that we see, that, that was all under item one of, of the exposition, Christ, the foundation of his new temple, the church. And I think it's very clear. It's, it's, not, a, it's not debatable. Look, this is the thing that's foundational for us, Christ Jesus. Okay, secondly, though, there's a coming day of reckoning for the churches of the earth. So people were building on that foundation. They might be building with, with what? With gold, silver, precious stones. Now, there's going to be a testing of the building that comes. He says, with fire. And the gold, silver, and precious stones, in the day of judgment that will come, they'll make it through that test of fire. Why? Because they're genuine. They're real. All right? But if it's wood, hay, and straw, if you have a whole building and all it is is wood, hay, and straw, how's that going to do in the fire of judgment? Not well, right? It, it won't be purified. It will be utterly destroyed and be exposed to have never actually been a part of that true church of Jesus Christ. So uh, our, the, I, I guess one way you could look at it after this big snowstorm is think about this. Are we building up to code? What if somebody builds some buildings, right? Some homes, let's say, and they really look wonderful. And you look at the roofs and you say, oh, the, look at the shingles on those roofs. What if there's cardboard underneath the shingles and you have a storm like we had before? Oh, it was pretty sturdy cardboard, you know? But it was cardboard. And that's not up to code to build a building that way. What if you actually, if you find, as you often do, when something's not up to code, it's not just one thing that's not up to code, but there are a bunch of things. I see, I see some knowing expressions. <laughs> You've dealt with this. Uh, there are a bunch of things that are not up to code, particularly in a part of the world where there's a lot of do-it-yourself stuff going on. Well, they did it themselves, and they built up their house. And then a storm comes, and then you find out through that test what's actually real. Brothers and sisters, there's a storm that is coming. There is a day of judgment that's coming, and God has, uh, has made it very clear to us that it, it's not a judgment of snow. It's a judgment of fire. And so there are certain things that could never make it through that judgment, but they may be quite attractive to people and popular, and people may say, no, this is the way you build a church. You know, This is the way you do it. That, and, and yet we'd have to say, look, is it just wood, hay, stubble, you know, straw? Is, is that all it is? Or is there something that God himself has built, made you to be living stones in the temple of the Holy Spirit, precious, chosen by God to last, made to last? Are you gold and silver? Are you actually the precious possession of Almighty God bought by the blood? of Jesus Christ, right? That's how we'll know what's actually been built. And what will happen is all of a sudden, what's what has been hidden, and often in, in things that are built, you said, well, there's a lot that's hidden. You know, there's a lot that's hidden there, but one day it will be revealed by the test and here by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So now, for think about the builder again for a second here, right? Okay, so you have Paul, he was a master builder, a skilled master builder, put that foundation of Christ through the preaching of the word. He used the scriptures and always preaching Christ from the scriptures. He built up that, um, that first foundation. Others came and built up, built alongside. Apollos and others built alongside. See, if, that, if, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. Well, this is a very frequent teaching for us in Old and New Testament. Think about, for instance, the parable of the talents, right? Or in another place, it's called the parable of the minas. And what happens is a servant is given certain things to go and, go and use that well, use it for the master. Well, here we think about Paul and others who are doing this ministerial work of preaching the word. Well, have they done what they ought to in that? Or have they instead been influenced by, by whatever is the prevailing popular thing at the moment and they've gone in that direction instead? Because, you know, if you do what God tells you to do here, he said, there's actually a reward for that. 
And, and we read about that in the parables here. You've been done great with the five minus. Here are five cities here, somehow in the eternal uh, kingdom that you're in charge of. I, I don't know all of what that means. All I know is that, you know, there'll be rewards. Maybe you get a crown, but then you know what you do with those crowns, right? Crown him with many crowns because you realize, look, this was always about Jesus, the cornerstone, always about Jesus, the foundation, always about Jesus, the culmination of all things. So anything that I've been given is just something I was given and now crown him with many crowns. All right. So if, but what if, what if uh, instead what happens is a genuine Christian person is actually out trying to build up a church. He finds out a way to maybe to, to, to tap into the prevailing desire of that place and time. For instance, it's a, say it's the Middle Ages in Europe. Well, what he does is he acquires, he acquires a lot of holy objects, sacred relics. And that really is the way that people, you know, they want that. They want to know. I go to a cathedral where we have these sacred relics. Calvin did a very amusing thing in talking about the sacred relics. And he started to talk about all the different pieces of different people that we had. He said, if you put it all together, you're going to have a whole city of people because of all these relics that are all over the place, right? But listen, that was never the answer for us. Some little piece of something that's left over from the days of Jesus to be the answer. And to us, it's not a very persuasive thing in our place and time that would be attracted to that. But, you know, we've had different things in different places and times. Very often we've thought about psychological, psychological well-being and using the best teachings of, that we have from the science of the mind and trying our best to understand that. And it even could be a good thing. But then it, what happens is it displaces Christ as, as the center. And all of a sudden, everything really becomes psychology. There was a time when that seemed to be really taking over the church, but now it seems like we're on to other things still. So we move, we go, we go on to the next thing. Sometimes people are looking for business success. Other people are attracted to celebrities, either inside or outside of the church, and, and they want that. Many times people just want to be left alone to be whoever they are. And the church that can seem to accommodate that the best is a winner, it would seem, until this day of judgment comes. And then that person who may have actually been a genuine Christian, who was a worker for the Lord, but got swept up into this bad ministry, right? That person, well, though he himself will be saved, it will only be as through fire. In other words, he lost the church because it wasn't the church. It was something else that he was building up. Isn't that a little bit horrifying to us to realize you could be working and working and working on something that, that you think is the church of Jesus Christ, and then all of a sudden it's, it's revealed that, that no, that, that wasn't it at all. But you just fell for what looked like a very attractive thing. You, you took the bait. Somebody was out there fishing for you. And they put out some really attractive bait and you gobbled it up and you did your ministry that way. And then later on at the day of judgment, you found out that a lot of your work really amounted to nothing. So, well, here's the thing I think for us to be able to see is that ministerial labors will be judged by their faithfulness to Christ, our foundation. There may be other things we can see in the scriptures where we could say this, this makes a ministry faithful and good and true. That's fine. But here, it has to do with faithfulness to Christ. And I guess the most obvious thing that I want to say before I even get into the applications we have listed there is just to say, Jesus Christ was faithful to Jesus Christ. That's the answer for us. When he came to build his church, he did it the right way. He built it on himself as the foundation. That was not an easy thing to do. It required a scrupulous attention to the voice of his father, telling him what to do when all the world, including his own apostles, might have said, no way, don't do that. No, he said, the cross is the way. And he kept on going. His obedience to the law and to the mission 
that, that his father gave him to do was so exemplary that we could say there's, there's nothing lacking in it. Jesus was faithful to Jesus. And that's why any of us are saved is because of that. So let that sink into your heart because you have something that's very reliable here that's based on the perfection of the true master workman. You know, the one who came as the servant of the Lord and at great cost to himself, gave himself up for you, glorified his father and brought you into the temple of the Holy Spirit. Thank God for Jesus. Mm -hmm. So what other applications can be made? And now, now we start to think, okay, let's think beyond Paul and Apollos and people like me and others, and well-known people, lesser known people that are trying to bring the word of God. What if we think beyond? Well, for all of us, Jesus is the Lord, our righteousness, and the only foundation in the house of God. And of course, that has implications for all of our lives really struck by this in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 23, 6, it, it uses the term, the, the Lord is our righteousness or the Lord our righteousness, two times. One time, it's talking about a singular individual who's called the branch, who's descended from David, and, and even a root of Jesse, David's father. It's called this this branch that will come. He's a singular individual. We know who he is. It's Jesus Christ. He is the Lord who is our righteousness. But then later on in the book, in chapter 33, verse 16, it describes not just an individual, but a whole city that's connected to the individual. And that whole city is called the Lord is our righteousness. Boy, there's a story there for us. You see, if we understand the single individual and what he has done, and we can explain that to others, and you embrace that in your own life, if you're a living letter of that, then you are part of the household of God, the city of God that can never be destroyed, the city of the Jerusalem that is above. And wouldn't the forces of evil like to get their hands on that city that is above? But they can't destroy it. They can burn things here below and make it seem like they're the ones who bring the frightening judgment upon whatever they choose uh, to scare. But we know that they cannot touch the true temple of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, what I want to do on this first application is just make a, a connection here for you in terms of your own study. I want to make a plea for what's called biblical theology. Some of you may have heard that term. Biblical theology versus systematic theology. Systematic theology organizes the teaching that we have in the Bible according to topic, and it's very helpful for us. So, for instance, when we look at a catechism, we're looking at systematic theology, things organized by topic with proof texts, all right? But there's another kind of theology that's very important, too. It's called biblical theology. Biblical theology moves through the whole of the scripture and looks at the story in its unfolding nature so that you're able to take it in. I want to make a plea here that what's written in Jeremiah is about Jesus, and that what's written in Genesis is about Jesus. The Psalms are about Jesus. First Chronicles is about Jesus. So are the Gospels, the letters, the book of Revelation, the whole story is built on the cornerstone. Now, here's the thing. We know this is the case because Paul didn't preach the gospel from 1st and 2nd Corinthians. He didn't have it. When he preached the gospel, when he worked as a skilled master builder, what was he using? Genesis through Malachi. And what did he lay? What foundation? Did he lay a foundation of Moses? Not at all. Did he lay a foundation of David or Boaz or no, the foundation he laid from Genesis through Malachi was Jesus. So obviously Jesus is there in the Old Testament. So won't you see that story unfold? The beautiful biblical theology. I mean, it's theology in the order that God would tell. Just laid out for us so that the story grips our hearts. Not just so we can say, well, here's the answer. Systematic theology is super useful for that. 
What's the answer to this question? I'm very interested in it. Good, look at look at this. There's proof text here. But something else we need to, together with that systematic theology, biblical theology. Oh, I love this story. I love this story. Just one example of this is in the historical books. God has two terms in the historical books. One of them is in the book of Ruth, and the other one is in the book of Esther. What he does is he has, he has two turning points in the history of what he's doing with Israel. And, he, and what he does, he essentially does this. He's telling the whole story. And he says, now we're going to slow down here for a second. I just want to look at one thing. Let, let's look what happens. And the reason is why? Because Ruth is going to be the turning point that leads us to the line of faith. Everything else from that point will have turned according to the line of David. And then we're going to go on until we get to Esther. Again, he says, we better slow down here because there's a turn coming. So you don't want to miss the turn. Here it is. In the book of Esther, we find out that not only did many people go off into exile, but many of them never came back. Oh, that's a turning point. That means synagogues all over the known world. That's going to be super important to take us into the New Testament era. So that when missionaries go out with the message of the cross, they can largely go into places where there actually is a synagogue there. That was a turning point that happened, we see in Esther, as we see this whole Persian empire. And a message needs to go out that's going to affect Jews and has to go to all these provinces. Why? Because there were synagogues all over the place. Why? Because there were Jews all over the place. Why? Because Almighty God had ordained that the Jews who were so persecuted would not actually be brought to oblivion, but that they would exist and continue, and they would be actually a very important part of the message going to the Gentiles all over the earth. You see, it's all about Jesus and the plan of Almighty God. The reason we went down the line of David would, was because of Jesus. The reason that we went to all the, all the people groups of the earth was because of the promise of God in Jesus was not just for Jews, but was for every tribe. And tongue and nation. This whole thing holds together. Is there some other story I don't know about that would explain history so well where everything holds together? Because I'm unaware of it. There are utopian schemes that have popped up here and there. They come and they go. I love the little thing I saw recently that was about Marxism. And they had, you know, it was an anniversary of some kind for Marx. And, and they and had a big picture, you know, what he looked like. And they said, these are the countries that experience prosperity through, through Marxism. And it just says one, two, three, four, five, and nothing there. There's no one that has experienced prosperity through that utopian scheme. And you know what? Those who follow the ideas that somehow the business of America or the celebrities that are so important right now, how many countries can, uh, or movements like that can give you eternal life. None of them can do it. Only Jesus Christ. And the whole story told in the scriptures is just so rich and so full. It's good for us. Second point, ministerial efforts that are not of God will ultimately fail. We just said that. So we must not fall. We must not fall for that idea to say, well, look, at look, this church is doing that. That church is doing this. And that's the way we actually succeed. Hey, who said we could invent our own ministry here? Is this just all left up to us what to do? Or shouldn't we look and see what, what does the cornerstone say? What does the word teach us? What's the right way for us to go here and then go about doing it and leaving the results to him? And thirdly, in a world of futility, only the work of Christ will last you know, the book of, of Ecclesiastes makes it clear what Romans 8 also says, that the world is subject to futility. The word vanity is used in Ecclesiastes. It has to do with a mist. It's something that it's, it's just, it comes and it goes. And you think, well, I'll spend my whole life on, on this mist. I'm going to make a house built of mist. I'm going to cover it with some clouds. And, and we'll, let's see how it lasts. Well, it's nothing. It's just blown away before you know it. And that's what can happen to, to all of man's works in this world of futility. But if we are instead tied into something that lasts, like the work of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, that's forever. And no one can blow that away. 
So this is what, what you and I have done. Here we go. Listen, last point. When you are tied into that as believers, living stones in the temple of the Holy Spirit, guess what? It's not just about what your minister is saying or Paul or anybody else, but you're actually a part of that whole ministry. And your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Isn't that good news? So many things in our, our life, we say, well, I don't know, that really never amounted to anything. Well, I tried to do this. I tried to do that. That didn't happen. I had this great wish, and that never quite happened. Listen, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I don't know all of how it works out. I just know that's the way 1 Corinthians 15 ends. That in this resurrection kingdom, what you do for the Lord is not for God. Establish the work of our hands, O Lord. Establish the work of our hands. But not work that's just based on our own ideas of what we think we should do, but work that's actually built on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Because there is no other foundation for the church than the one that has been laid. Let us pray. Oh, Father, help this uh, message that we have heard today from this writing of Paul in 1 Corinthians 3, just really be solidified in our own souls so that we will not be easily tossed about from one direction to the next uh, like little children, but instead that we would be growing up into him who is the head. And Father, we, we just desire over the course of our reading the scriptures and learning about your son that we would more and more be conformed to Jesus, the, this great Son of God. We thank you in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. Okay, hymn 264, let's stand. None other land. Seven thirty-one. we read, and when they had mocked him, 
they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. I think one way you can look at these passages we've been reading is that when the world stands in judgment of the Messiah who came to be the cornerstone, what kind of verdict does the world deliver? This is what we see. Well, they use him as far as they wish. For instance, for a laugh, they could use him. So they mocked him, but eventually they got sick of that. It was, it was enough with the mocking. And so they stripped him of the robe that they put on him to mock him. And they put his own clothes on him and led him away to be, to, to crucify him. So that's, that's the judgment of the world. But our judgment when we come to this table is to say something very different. But Lord, may we never be finished with you. And may you never be finished with us. Instead, may we always be united to you. United to your death and resurrection. United to your reigning above and ruling over all things. May we never be cast out, but with you always. And then we have ringing back in our ears this good word that comes to us from the scriptures. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. And that is our confidence as we would partake here today of this bread and this cup. It's a Look, whatever else has gone wrong in my life, this cornerstone is right. This cornerstone is right. I'm, I'm staying with this. So if, if you have put your trust and hope in Christ and profess that here or in some other place, to be a part of the communing body of the Lord, partake of this here today. Let's ask for the Lord's blessing. Father, we, we do ask that you would take this sacrament and take the bread and the fruit of the vine and use them for your purposes here today as a great encouragement to your people to continue in this pathway that you have laid out for us in Jesus name. Amen. <laughs>
take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it all of you. Lord, we thank you for your mercies. We thank you, Father, for the, the privilege of hearing your promises and for the gift that we have not only of faith, but of hope. Lord, we pray that you would make us to be people of love, that hearing your promises and believing and setting our hopes on Christ and this eternal resurrection kingdom that we would give our lives for others around us, especially in our marriages, in our homes, and, and throughout the earth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hymn 196, let's stand at the Lamb's High Feast we say. <laughs>